Hi, this is Avita Duffy and Sean Duffy here at um, From Z to X, a new podcast for The Federalist. Um, so first we're gonna talk about um, the university professor at, at the school that I go to, the University of Chicago, um, who's recently come under some uh, fierce opposition from students, um, faculty and alumni for opposing um, certain measures that have been taken by the university's um, EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Organization on campus. So, so I obviously, you told me the story, and as mm -hmm. a father who, again, pays uh, tuition at the University of Chicago is quite upsetting. So what did the professor say, Evita, uh, that made this uh, equity and diversity group so angry on campus? So the the diversity group came to to give a a, a lecture to the to the um you know the department the geophysical science department which he teaches in this professor, um, was it, and was it, was it to students or to teachers to, to the faculty to Dorian Abbott to the professor and the other the other um, faculty in in um in the department, and he he felt like the measures the the measures that they were you know suggesting that they take to. Um, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion um, were actually discriminatory. Um, and he said that in his own department, he's actually witnessed um, them discriminate against um, males and Chinese students. And he, um, he didn't think that that was becoming of a university and their goals and, and, and what they're really all about. And so he, he posted five um, videos uh, to YouTube and uh, just explaining what, like, what, what, what the problem is with these, with these measures, um, how they're unbecoming of a university, okay. and what, what were the measures of each? What, what did they actually want the faculty to implement? Yeah, um, they well, they, I mean, they, they wanted the faculty to implement, um, you know, like quotas on, on who, and who's in, um, who's being accepted into the, into either, um, uh fellowship programs or to conferences or in, even to, to the faculty staff because there, there's there, he's a part of a committee that decides um, who's going to be part of the geophysical science department faculty um, and so they were saying we need more of x person um, or let, let's put in x versus y person because you know they're you know so and so and they have this th like they're this color skin or they are they are a female um, and so he said that those measures were, were, were not were not right I mean we should be accepting people based off of um, Except of you know how how good of a candidate they are, and, and not based off of their skin tone or their gender. So in essence, he was saying this is not based on the quality of your work and your intellect that gets you in. Uh, we're going to look at other factors like you know are you a minority, are you transgender, mm -hmm. are you a woman, and it's those factors that will play a huge role in who gets the fellowships or who gets into the programs. Is that right? Yes, that that's right. And so he posted five videos to YouTube, um, and they were they were uh, you know met with fierce opposition and uh, people called them aggressive. Um, they said that they were they were unwelcoming um, to, to you know students of color or or um, or people who you know have different gender identities. And so they they students and faculty and alumni put this list of demands, 11 demands, which included him being stripped of some of his responsibilities and titles, um, have students be allowed to leave his class if they feel unsafe um, to switch to a different instructor. Um, and and they also asked for the university, uh, the geophysical science department, I'm sorry, to come out with a statement so that they condemn um, the, the videos and the content of them, um, of Dorian, of Professor Dorian uh, Abbott's videos, so. So, so quickly, um, when you look at those who are being admitted into these programs or getting the fellowships, um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's everyone who is not a white straight male, right? So was there like 95% of all the kids that were let in were were white straight males and they were saying we need more diversity in the program because there is none or um, so we need to get it closer to 50 50 or you know a, a, a make we have we look at the makeup of our community and we want it, that to be the makeup of the fellowship and the program what were they actually you know pushing so right so for so for one example he said that he was on on, the, on a board to a committee to decide um you know what what uh who was going to get this this fellowship program this really coveted fellowship program and they had an equal number um of male and female um, applicants, and they they actually accepted far more female applicants than males. Um, and you think that you know there's 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 you know gender equality, and 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 males and females are just as smart as each other. So the 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 numbers should be similar instead of this out this way more females being accepted than males. Um, and he said that this is directly because of um, the measures. Uh, that or the, the the pressure that these committee members feel to accept more women or to accept more people of color um, into the program um, because of you know the, the pressure they feel from you know organizations like diversity equity and inclusion.
So you said he got, he got a lot of pushback when he, you know, just basically stated his opinion, right? He said, this is, Mm -hmm. this is my opinion that we should look at the quality of the work. And yes, there probably can be some consideration for diversity, but the diversity has gone completely the other way. So my question for you is, is, and I guess I I don't know the answer to this, but there's a, there is this Chicago principle. Is that right? Yes. What is the Chicago principle? And is this meeting with kind of the, the, the public persona that the University of Chicago has that they put out to their donors and their alumni versus what they're actually doing inside the university. So the, the university has come up with a lot of statements um, that that are you know held very dearly to to a lot of alumni and, and students. Um, one of which is the Chicago Principles, which says that you know we're not going to allow for safe spaces and we want students to think freely um, and and come up with decisions on their own and not have it be um, you know endorsed by the university. We're not indoctrinating. We're educating, and um, Another another one of those documents that's that's part of the Chicago Principles says that professors are allowed to have their own viewpoints, um, and the university is never going to tell a, prof- a professor um, to to rescind what he has to say or denounce it publicly because their job isn't to, um, to to tell people what to think. It's to it's to give them it's to you know expose them to all kinds of knowledge and then have them make those decisions for themselves. Um, and so so if they were if they were to if the department or the or the university were to adhere to any of the demands um, that they made. Um, they would actually be going against their own, um, you know, deeply held uh, commitments. So it's 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 a it's a very uh, tough tough topic. <laughs> no, and so um, do you know any feedback from campus? Did did this professor get a lot of support from other professors? Did other kids rally around him, or is he kind of left out alone and by himself um, to fend to defend? What should be a criteria based on qualification versus, you know, gender and race? So I spoke to Professor Abbott on uh, Sunday, and and he said that you know I mean the overwhelming the outward uh, response has been very negative on Twitter. There have been his colleagues and and students, um, you know, really berating him over social media, um, which is which is completely unproductive because he said that the whole point of his videos was to was to open up dialogue and to and to give them a different point of view. Um, and he said there are some students who are who are in support of him and and you know who who want to you know to to who have either believe in what he said or think he has the right to say it, um, and. So he uh, he said that those people are there, but they're they're just not quite as vocal. I would say, as a, as a parent, um, and a lot of us who are older went to school, and it was this idea where you were challenged. You got exposed to all different kind of principles and ideas, and there was great debate. And sometimes it was offensive. Sometimes we didn't agree with it, but we didn't have to retreat to our safe spaces. It was truly an open dialogue, and it seems like on today's college campus. Um, you can't go against the mob. And if you do, you very well may lose your job or you may be silenced or you lose students, which as parents who pay for this, are we really getting an education or are we getting an indoctrination? But I want to ask you a question. So you uh, last year uh, did a whiteboard that said, you know, COVID, I'm sorry, so- socialism will kill more people than COVID or something along those lines. And, and you got death threats, physical harm threats, and you reached out to the IOP to discuss this with them and have a dialogue with them because they were the IOP, which is run by David Axelrod. They, you know, they put that, that whiteboard out. Um, when you got those death threats, did anyone from the, from the college reach out to you to say, hey, Evita, do you feel threatened? Do you need a safe space? Should we do something for you when, when, when you're getting so much hate from, from the campus? Did they reach out to you or did they reach out to other people in regard to people feeling feeling threatened? So that that's a that's a wonderful question. Um, what happened was uh, the university, first of all, never reached out to me. I actually reached out to them and said that I wanted a no contact agreement with the person who gave me a death threat. Um, and the IOP, who was the source of, of the controversy, actually the day after my, my photo was posted and it had gone viral and I was receiving all of these threats, the next day they cleared their schedules to meet with offended students, um, people who who saw what they what I what I wrote. Um, I wrote, you know, the coronavirus won't destroy America, but socialism will. And um, you know, they they were they cleared the schedules, talked to these students who felt uncomfortable with what I said. No one reached out to me. Not a single person from the IOP asked me how I was doing, who was the real, the real um, 
you know, target uh, of, 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 I mean, I had the entire university uh, at my back, you know, posting things about me, writing things about me. Um, and, and the only person who, and, and the, the real target was not getting actually any, any support from the university whatsoever. And I suspect, and I wrote this in my op-ed that if it was, if I was a member of the, a member of the LGBT community, if, if I was being targeted, not because of what I believe intellectually, but because of, of my race or, or my gender, that, you know, they there would have been a different reaction. And, and this, the IOP is the Institute of Politics. Um, yes, which is run by David Axelrod, who is the um, who is a former member of the Obama administration. I just want to make one one clarifying point about Professor Abbott's story. Um, the university administration, so so the actual the president of the university, um, made a statement saying that they are still committed to the Chicago principles and they will not, um, you know, say that you know come out and say that they condemn anything that Professor Abbott said because it's not their place. However, on, on Wednesday, we're going to find out what the department says, because the letter, the demands were actually sent to the, the geophysical science department. Um, and that might be a different story. Right. So and we'll I, see what happens. And I brought that up because here, you were the one that was actually truly threatened, right? And, and when you had your experience, and they didn't reach out to you, the truly threatened, they reached out to those who could have been offended by what you said and felt threatened by what you said, as opposed to the actual threats that came your way. Right. And here with this professor, they don't reach out to him maybe about the hate that he's getting from students. They reach out to potential students that might be threatened. And the actions of the, uh, of, of the college speak volumes about where they stand on issues like this. And I don't I mean you're, you're, a, you're of a Hispanic descent, you're Mexican, you're a minority, but that doesn't really matter. This is truly about politics. If you're a minority conservative, you don't get any leeway with the university. You can be anybody, however, and a liberal, and they step forward to defend you. And I, I mean, again, I don't think a lot of a lot of parents understand how far left these college campuses have gone. And if we don't talk to our kids and educate our kids, um, or at least have dialogue with our kids, they're not going to get it on a campus. They're going to be indoctrinated by you know the masses on campus. And I think this is a great example of one professor who stands up for truth. And he pops his head up, and not a political guy, right? He's not a he's not a Republican. Yeah, that's what he said. He said, "I'm apolitical." I was so he was taken aback by the response he got. He had no idea what happened because it's just not his thing. He doesn't even he doesn't he never talks about this. He gets punched in the head. He says, "I'm a science guy. That's all I am. I'm a science guy." <laughs> so uh, listen, I think I think stories like this though are important to expose mm -hmm. universities who do these kind of things because there's a lot of people who feel very fondly about the university and give their money to the universities to help fund universities, maybe they will rethink that um, when they see how universities are behaving with equality with regard to ideas and political viewpoints. So yeah. good for you for, uh, hopefully you're gonna help ex expose this and you, you can you can write on this, which I think would be great uh, to bring more attention to it. Yeah, look out for an article on Wednesday when we figure out what, what, the, what the department's decision is, I'm gonna write a piece. <laughs> so. Okay, so let's move on. What's our next topic? Um, so we're going to talk about The Atlantic and a recent uh, article that was written by author Sarah Zhang about Down syndrome and specifically Down syndrome in Denmark, where over 95% of children who receive a Down syndrome prenatal diagnosis choose to abort their child. Um, and last year, only 18 children with Down syndrome were born in the entire country. 18. Right. Yes. So, you wrote an so you wrote an article about, you know, what, uh, what the, about the... Um, the the Atlantic piece, and obviously our family is um, very moved by the Down syndrome issue because I have a Down syndrome daughter who is also your sister, right? Right. So, what was your take on on the Atlantic article? And this is an article that you put up on the Federalist, right? Yesterday, right. I believe. Yes. Um, so, what's really troubling about the article um, is that they have it's a there's a real moral ambivalence to eugenics and genocide because that is what is happening to down syndrome children not just in Denmark but across the world um, and so th the author Sarah Zhang she what she did is she employed this rhetorical trick where she said I'm presenting both sides of the argument the pro-choice side and the pro-life side and let's not judge anyone for the for their decisions and that was that's the real moral of the story for her article and, and the truth is there is no humanity, as she likes to say, and there is no moral ground truth, as she said, in, in um, eugenics and in genocide and in killing someone, um, someone who's 
part of, you know, a group of people who are the least powerful in the world, um, just because they have an extra chromosome. That is wrong. That's a, that's the wrong take to have. Um, and so someone needed to call her out for it. So I, I wrote this article because like you said, I have a little sister with Down syndrome and, and she's a beautiful little girl and she, you know, she doesn't, uh, doesn't deserve to be discriminated against just because of that. No one does. Everybody's life has value. And I think what's interesting is is liberals, not even liberals, I'm sure the leftists, because liberals, I don't think would have the same view as the leftists, but they're all part of the mm -hmm. same party. But they talk about acceptance, they talk about rights, they talk about diversity, they talk about all of these issues that sound really good. But when it comes down to brass taxes and says, are you going to actually support diversity? And kids with Down syndrome are diverse and, and they have a whole range of their functionality. It is a diverse group of people who, as you mentioned, are the most vulnerable because they're in the womb. They don't, they don't have lobbyists. They can't give political contributions. They can't vote. When they're in the womb, they need other people to stand up and fight for them because they have no rights. Um, and because of that, you see these leftists say their their lives don't have value. Their lives are meaningless to us. And so let's um, let's exterminate a whole group of people who I would argue give great joy in life. And I, I want your perspective on this because mine is when we found out, Rachel and I did that we were gonna have a Down syndrome daughter. I'm not gonna tell you that I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I, I have never had a Down syndrome child. And I reached out to other parents of children with Down syndrome and tried to get their feedback. What was it like? How was it? And everybody I talked to basically said, I know that this is going to be different for you. The dog's barking in the background. I yeah, love it. Sorry about you. that. Uh, this is what you get when you have a house of uh, nine, two parents, one dog who likes to <laughs> have squirrels or people walking by. But but this idea that um, everyone who has a child with Down syndrome, in essence, says they have been the lights of our family. They have been the most wonderful addition. And it's it might be a little frightening because you haven't experienced it, but you are going to see the joy of it. And I got to tell you what, from my perspective, our little Valentina has been such a beautiful addition to our family. She's such a wonderful little girl. We've gone through heart surgery um, and, and some other operations and procedures and challenges. But do I think her life has value? Absolutely. Has she added value to our family? Absolutely. And to think that these leftists can say that we can decide what life has value and, and what life doesn't have value. Um, mm -hmm. If they can do it with a Down syndrome child or any child, how far will that go? They can make that decision for anybody. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. My, my take on it. I, I think that's great. I think that's something really important that, that um, you know, we, we need to think about is that historically, um, eugenics for people who you know ha have disabilities ha was you know to to like lift strains off of society. That was the purpose of eugenics. That was the rationale for it. Um, and today it's the same thing. Eugenics still exists. It never stopped. It just changed names. Um, and so now it's in, in countries where you have universal health care um, and and people with disabilities put, you know, uh, cost the state more money, you, you see a real incentive for it. There is a reason why countries like Denmark and countries like Iceland and so on, who have universal health care, have these high rates of abortion for children with Down syndrome and other disabilities. It's a, there's, an, there's a government incentive for it. Um, and so that's that's really troubling. And that's something that I'm, as Americans, we should think about because we already, we already know that, that children with Down syndrome in the United States um, are aborted at very high rates, we're not sure exactly how much. There's, there's, you know, indications that it's around 80 to 90 percent. Um, certainly not 95 to 99 as they are in Denmark and Iceland. Um, but, but we could get there eventually um, if we, if we implement universal healthcare, and that's a real problem. And, and Iceland actually recently bragged about curing Down syndrome. They didn't cure Down syndrome. <laughs> They just killed a bunch of children, um, and so it's 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 not just a Denmark problem. It's not just an Iceland problem. It's this is a this is a nas international problem that we're having. Well, I, you're you're right, and I just look at the the Democrats' ugly past with eugenics, mm -hmm. um, and their ugly past with slavery, and even other leftist governments around the world. Uh, history has shown um, when you implement these ideas that you want to have a more elite race. Um, the problems with that. And I, I think our society is better off when we value all of life and the most vulnerable of life we value and support and cherish and welcome into our community. I think we are, we're healthier um, and frankly, a bit holier um, when we have those principles in place. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs>
So listen, read, read Avita's article in The Federalist um, on our little Valentina and her pushback on these leftists you know, in, the, uh, in the Atlantic. It's, it's a great article. And uh, again, gives some different perspective from a family who has a, a new Down syndrome child who's a year old who had heart surgery. Uh, she gives a great perspective. Check it out and read it um, and uh, get our perspective. Yeah, who truly is the, the favorite of the family. Um, so anyways, thank you everybody for watching. Um, we'll see you guys next week. All right, have a good one. Bye guys.